session entitled Phoning Home, Creating a Distributed Network of Autonomous Self-Healing Sites with SaltStack. Uh, the project I'm gonna talk about today is something we did for uh, an international customer, and it was probably the thing that had the most geek coolness of any project I've been involved with. So it, it's a real uh, pleasure to, to talk through what we did. Just a, a word about uh, where I'm from and my company. Uh, my co-author, Vlad, and myself put this together. And if you look at the pictures, uh, any guess which, which one of us is the uh, technologist? So Risk Focus, the company I'm from, is a 15-year-old consulting company that does two things. We work in the financial services in uh, risk and trade solutions, and the group I had does DevOps and cloud transformation, mainly in financial services, but we also do quite a bit of telecom work as well as some healthcare work. Um, and we're a firm with offices around the world, so we've got people in uh, New York, Pittsburgh, Toronto, uh, London, Frankfurt, and Riga. And most of our devs are either in Pittsburgh or Riga, with some of us in, uh, in New York. So let me tell, talk a little bit about this engagement, because as I said, it, it was one of the cooler ones. A international provider of satellite data approached us uh, they are a global provider, meaning almost completely worldwide provider of digital connectivity. And they have a customer base of both remote and movable sites. So their customers may be located in the middle of an ocean. Their customers may be located on a, a continental shelf with a big drill bit at the end. Their customers may be on a remote mining site. Uh, their customers may be shipping, so cargo ships, container ships, uh, passenger ships, private yachts, and some of their customers actually are in airplanes. Uh, the problem they wanted to solve was better control over their distant and distal uh, networks and uh, distributed in infrastructure and installations. What they wanted to start offering was not just control over these services, but actually offer services to other companies who are interested in putting their own applications there. So in effect, they wanted to go into the database or data center business, but wanted to put those data centers on ships, on airplanes, in remote mining sites. And the question is, why would they want to do that? Well, if you're a ship, uh, you've bought your engine from, say, Rolls-Royce or GE. Rolls-Royce and GE want to monitor your, your ship's engine very, very carefully. And so they'll want to put their app somewhere. This international provider of connectivity wanted to be in the business of providing a location for a GE, for a Rolls-Royce, um, for the makers of hulls, for the owners of ships, uh, to put their own apps in to better monitor their ships. We're in a world of um, infrastructure things. Ships are very, very big and very complicated things. One of the things that's non-technical that made the, the gig kind of difficult to do is ships are typically, and any of this infrastructure is typically owned by one group managed by a second group, operated by a third group, and crewed by a fourth group. So it, lots of moving parts, lots of uh, different actors or players in the game, and it meant that everything couldn't rely on people on the ground. So the engagement, as I mentioned, was to create a control framework that from a central location managed these remote data centers around the world. Uh, the central control hub had to be very, very light touch because there were times when the distributed edge locations weren't in communication with the central location for hours, days, or weeks at a time. The pipe to those locations is very, very tight and very long, so latency is a real problem, as is um, bandwidth. And the location itself, these floating data centers or, or edge locations, are very resource constrained. The actual gig that we were asked to do was three things. The first was edge automation. So can we create a central, I'm sorry, can we create a data center that's distributed uh, and actually orchestrate that data center, have it self-orchestrate? So it needed to be able to install itself, upgrade itself, monitor and heal itself. We needed to assure uh, services in spite of either weather or physical constraints, 
and provide quality of service metrics back not only from the data center but from the applications living on the data center. And that becomes really important. It actually had real world implications. This, uh, this particular client also uh, formed the network connectivity. You'll remember there was a, um, a Malaysian Airlines flight that disappeared over the Pacific. Well, the telemetry was coming through uh, this client's network. And so the implications of getting, of getting the signal out become rather important. And finally, because they don't own the physical infrastructure, they only own the pipes and the virtual infrastructure, security becomes a real, real issue. And so we had to make sure the system was protected from both external as well as internal attacks. It required hardening the system, hardening the OS, hardening the network, um, and of course, uh, more than garden variety, uh, uh, data encryption both in flight and at rest. And of course, the system needed to be self-auditing and that information provided back to the central location. So the four things we had to do were orchestration, monitoring, messaging, and auditing of all components. It provided to be a really challenging project. First, the technical challenges. I put a picture of a, of a cell phone on or a satellite cell phone because Floating data centers, kind of high floating, we were extremely resource constrained in this. Uh, the total, uh, we, we had to build a system, I think it was within four gigs of RAM, um, something like 50 gig storage. So very resource constrained, and that wasn't just for the OS, that was for applications sitting on top of the OS as well. The second technical risk constraint is that the network is, is terrible going out to some of these sites. Latency is measured in seconds, and in some cases, tens of seconds. The bandwidth was measured in, um, I don't know how to put this, remember the 200K, 240 baud, 240, let's see, what was it? 2400 baud modems. That was a fat pipe. These are thinner pipes. So downloading packages for upgrades would take uh, hours. I mentioned the, uh, the staff on site, typically, on one of these sites, you have a, say, electrician's mate. And an electrician's mate knows how to do two things. Pull plug out, put plug in. So we weren't gonna be doing a lot of um, heavy duty diagnosis on site. And of course, there are things called hurricanes or in the Pacific typhoons, which affect the reliability, not only of the network, but of the infrastructure itself. And in these cases, manual intervention just wasn't an option. Like you, you talk about parachuting in uh, tech support. I mean, it was literal that you sometimes had to parachute in tech support. I, the guys I was working with would get a call, you need to be in uh, Hong Kong next week because a ship's coming into dock and we have a problem. So the answer to that is a completely self-healing system, one that manual intervention across a very thin pipe just wasn't necessary. What we ended up coming up with uh, was a self-healing system based on salt. And this was both at the customer's request as well as uh, our own expertise. And we layered this system into uh, each part of a reaction cycle. Because as I said, it had to be self-healing. So for us, a self-healing system has three pieces to it. There's very robust monitoring. Uh, there's reaction to that monitoring because the, the monitoring, when it deviates from uh, known quantity, prevent, has to uh, result in events, and those events need to be reacted to, and the reactions need to trigger orchestration. For a variety of reasons, SALT was an excellent choice for, um, uh, for, own, for operating the complete system, and so we chose SALT. We augmented its capabilities for a couple reasons that I won't go too deeply in here. On the monitoring side, we put in tick uh, because we love it and because Capacitor formed a very good time augmentation routine that allowed us to do more sophisticated event tracking. And for orchestration, the base system was all done in SALT. Uh, for some of the applications we installed, we did, we did orchestration with uh, HashiCorp's Terraform. The methodology for solving the problem, uh, this was CS 101, but it turned out to be really important. 
making sure that this state, this system stayed up is a big hairy problem. And so the way you solve big hairy problems is you decompose them into simple, more testable problems. And then you build up the platform from simple to complex. And that's a, um, that's not only how we developed the problem, but that ended up being the solution too. That we would literally build the, um, when constructing the system and rebooting the system, we'd go from simple states to more complex states. A word on technology, why salt? Well, I really don't have to justify the choice of salt to this group. Uh, but we, what we really liked and what we used to describe it to the client was its declarative syntax was very important because we're defining um, something that is end state. And I'll get a little bit into what, what that means in a minute. And of course, the reaction orchestration mechanism was pretty unique as a product. We chose Telegraph because both, I'm sorry, we chose Tick because both Telegraph and Capacitor handled the robust monitoring needs and allowed many different connectors to a variety of applications installed. And some of the probes, as I mentioned, were time out aggregated. And we used Terraform in conjunction with SALT because when we actually installed par third party applications, it became an easy delivery mechanism. And it allowed us to separate concerns of application deploy versus infrastructure deploy. And we were primarily focused on a very robust infrastructure deploy. The way we solved the problem was to define the entire system as a simple state machine. Now state machines aren't as popular as a concept as they've been years before, in previous years. A state machine is almost an electrical engineering or mathematical construct. So your washing machine in the days before a lot of, uh, a lot of digitalization was a state machine. And a state machine in this context is just defined states and transitions. The transitions are always triggered by events, whether those events be internal or external. We chose a state machine because it becomes eminently more testable, eminently more constrainable, and that means it's much more reliable. What we ended up needing to do was identify each of the stages in an evolution and then test the heck out of it because we could not have errant states. We couldn't have the system spin into an unknown state. That would uh, end up being a problem. In SALT, a state is a state, and it may not be apparent, but the number one problem with this client is we didn't know which state we were talking about. Is this a salt state or a finite state state? And we never did solve the problem, but everything was a state. In salt, a uh, state here is a deterministic uh, set of configurations, and as a rule of thumb, they were always defined by formula. Transitions in a finite state sense were always stimulated by a salt event and then processed by a salt reactor. And that worked both for pure salt orchestration. In some cases, we um, actually triggered salt states in the uh, state machine. In other cases, we trigger uh, terraform states, states that triggered terraform. And in our case, all was the triggers were originating in a capacitor. One note in a state machine, uh, path matters. So when you go from one state to another, the direction and which and the two connectivities make a difference, and when you're defining it in SALT, that means you need some dynamic store. So we actually used SED as a uh, dynamic pillar. So I waved my hands a little bit. Uh, no, I didn't. I waved my hands a little bit uh, and talked about state machine. Let me dive a little bit deeper into what it means for this project, because this became the heart of our deliverable, and it forms a really good model for decomposing some classes of difficult problems. Uh, the state machine we defined was going from, uh, let's see, is my cursor on? System configure to application install, to application start, to monitoring. There were actually more states in what we delivered for the client, but I simplified it for this talk because having 15 states on the board doesn't actually help you understand it more than having four. Each state goes through the same process where it gets sent a signal and the process is receiving a signal, reacting to the sig signal, executing a state, which then results in sending another signal. And so when you're building up a system, you build from simple states to more complicated states. In SALT, there's never a high state here. It's a set of orchestrations that are triggered by an event. The event can be successful completion of the previous event. 
So when we're building the system in the state machine, we start out at base and then go through transition through these various states. And so that's increasing the complexity for building the machine. If there's ever an errors in the system, you follow the same process, but you walk down. And we add an additional state here, the error state. So it's the same mechanism where you're sent a signal. This, in this case, it may be a monitor signal. This, the um, reactor receives a signal, reacts, orchestrates, and sends another signal. So if, for example, you get an error in monitoring, monitor triggers an error state, which may restart an application. If that fails, you may reinstall an application. If that fails, you might reconfigure the system. And this is very, very powerful. We're not healing applications in an arbitrary way. And so we're defining what the system, the states of the system is in very, very straightforwardly and in a very limited fashion. And if there's ever any error, we fall back to a previous state. So why do we do this? Testing. We can validate the machine and we can validate each of the states and it becomes much more straightforward than trying to test for unknown conditions. So given a state of, uh, getting, given a set of defined states and defined events, all we have to do is test each state, meaning once the system's in that state, all the components are up or running, the state actually uh, is self-detecting and uh, maintains itself. We then simulate failure, we send an outside signal, and what we're testing there is the finite state machine itself. Does it react accordingly and appropriately to each failure? And we test the transition does it walk to the next state? So we're testing a dozen things as opposed to as opposed to a hundred or a thousand things. If ever the system is out of a defined state, that's a bug. And we find those both in our testing and in the real world. But if we ever see an unexpected state, unexpected transitions, uh, those are bugs that, so that have to be fixed before shipping. That being said, it becomes a very straightforward set of conditions. And the way you maintain those conditions is you never introduce a new state yourself. In other words, if a component fails, you go down a step in the state machine. If a component doesn't restart, you go down a state in this, you go down a state in the state machine and never depend on um, individual or idiosyncratic methods of healing. And you do that because you know that every step you've, uh, you've tested, you've verified, and the system is responsive in the way you expect. So that's theory, but how does it actually look? The system itself uh, consists of a central control center with a number of network, distant network points scattered around the world. And each of the distant sites is attached to one of these network an interesting function of this network is that from time to time, one of the attachments will switch from network point to network point as the ship moves. So none of the connections are permanent, they're all ephemeral. We use central control for things like uh, distribution of patches because of course the system has to evolve over time. We have to add uh, vulnerabilities are discovered, the base OS has to be patched, new applications are installed or or old applications removed, et cetera. And the, and the system is orchestrated from that respect, from a central location, but any day-to-day -day business as usual happens on the ship itself. The SALT architecture was very straightforward. We had a central um, SALT master, and our recommendation at this point was uh, enterprise SALT, because you had to identify uh, a huge number of distant points. The initial first year projection was 5,000 network points. The, the ultimate addressable market was 250,000, which made for a uh, interesting set of scaling discussions. Traffic from uh, an initial cluster of salt masters would go through one of the network points, go through a syndic onto the ship, and then control various VMs on the ship itself. Uh, we had to use VMs for security reasons. We didn't want communication actually to the base OS or hypervisor itself. We wanted communications going uh, as directly as possible from our control center into the VMs. Uh, 
one, and one of the things that was being heavily uh, orchestrated was the network between the two. In terms of ship side, what we would get would be a device installed by an operator of a ship. It would be a, um, a machine in Iraq, a computer in Iraq, that our application would be installed on top of. So the base OS was a physical device, and we'd install an agent on that base OS, which would then communicate to a set of VMs uh, running on that device that weren't in any way except through that uh, base system talking to, uh, talking to the base OS. We ran KVM machines for uh, ease of orchestration. And then on top of the virtualization ran SALT as a central repo and central reactor. That SALT state machine was responsible for orchestration, driving orchestration, passing events. And I'll go through exactly how it looked on a ship or mostly exactly how it looked on a ship. And then orchestration for applications became a separate issue. Talked a lot about events, and that became a really critical thing here, where we would use uh, tick stack shown in blue, and then salt stack shown in, in yellow. So we would get events from Telegraph, which would go into influx and trigger capacitor events, which would push those events either directly to the salt reactor via, via HTTP, or through a salt bus via the local minion, through orchestration, and then onto the minion itself onto uh, the minion on various VMs. This allowed us to both take advantage of the, of the capabilities of, uh, of the tick stack, but also then have a, a complete event cycle within SALT. And this also became a, a very interesting testable thing. Just rules of thumb around how we use SALT. Uh, in such a situ system, there is no high state. So you're having a series of orchestrations that are uh, tailed ahead. The end of one orchestration fires off an event that fires the next orchestration. And successful orchestration sends that event to, the re to a reactor, which then triggers another orchestration. And we also, it was extremely important to separate testing of component failures from reactions. So a re we would test the reactions in isolation, test the component failures in isolation, then combine the two, which made for a much simpler separation of concerns. I mean, the power of the state machine was to allow us to test at the event level both pre and post, and it became almost an API. So what does this actually look like? Um, what I'm gonna show is a series of slides that are mostly accurate, but not completely accurate because the client wouldn't be happy to show the, the true system. And what we're gonna see is how the system evolved from first boot up uh, to running system. And each of the slides represents a, a slice of the state machine. So each represents an, a um, assault orchestration going from simpler to more complex. First one, or the zeroth level, is when the base system starts out, it uh, uses libvirt to create a, a set of uh, instantiate a set of KVM images, and each of these images uh, essentially had nothing on it. And that was an important thing that nothing was on it, because remember, the system has to be completely, completely self-healing. And one of the rules around self-healing was we go back to a completely known good state. We couldn't fall back to a system that had stuff installed in case there were problems with a upgrade or uh, problems with a package installed or an application installed. We had to go at the very base system all the way down to something completely clean. The first state after the um, applications installed are the base VMs, and here we use shared storage to have information for the next set of installs, where we'd install just uh, the base VM and the shared storage. Sec the second real step is to install salt. And the salt is configured to have a minion on each of the hosts uh, and a small keep alive system on our control VM because the, we also had to guard against salt itself failing. So we put as simple of a keep alive as we could to make sure that salt stayed up so that we had the ability to restart salt as part of the state diagram. Once salt's running, we use it to orchestrate monitoring. And without monitoring, the rest of the orchestration cycle doesn't work. 
So then we'd call up influx uh, capacitor and telegraph and put telegraph agents on each of the hosts. Up to this point, the system's completely self-contained. It can't call home at all. So that means there's no ability for an engineer to SSH into the system. Keep in mind we're on a cell phone and the cell phone hasn't made a call uh, back to mothership yet. So the next stage in the orchestration is to actually set up the networking back home across the satellite. Some of the components we were dealing with were appliances, and so were complete black boxes to us. Others were um, software-defined networking, open vSwitch and the, and the rest. And that then allowed us to create a network and orchestrate that network to meet the various needs of both application as well as ship crew uh, and owners of the system. Once that was in place, we could set up management, so connect back to, uh, back to the mothership which allowed us then to send in commands from home in case there were problems on a ship or remediations on the ship. And then set up applications themselves. And those applications would be uh, networked back into storage, et cetera, back in, uh, back in the central data repository. So that's essentially what the real world system looked like. But such a talk would not be very interesting unless I showed some demo of how it looked. So I'm going to show you guys a, um, a very, very simplified state machine orchestration. Essentially, it's orchestrating a sensor that's sitting on top of an engine. And for scale, these engines tend to be kind of big because they're powering very, very large, either, um, either for electrical power or, in this case, for propulsion. And what we'll see in the demo is really two factors. The first thing we're going to simulate is that uh, this monitor of the engine goes bad. It actually has a, um, it, it has a health check associated with it. The health, health check gives a bad result. And so we'll try to, uh, uh, the, the reactor will restart the system. So we'll go through one stage in the, sol in the um, state diagram going down uh, through an error state to trigger a, uh, a remediation, a standard remediation. Now, if the demo stopped there, I don't think it'd be very interesting because uh, I'm sure I have and I'm sure all of you have seen a system that restarts itself. That's not particularly interesting. The next phase of the demo will trigger a corruption, and so the system will have to reinstall uh, the, this application. Now, the interesting thing here is we'll walk through, the system will walk through the state diagram of trying to restart the application, it'll fail, and so it'll actually reinstall the application. If you're the developer of a application, all you've done is create a system for uh, item potently installing your application and restarting your application. And that separates your responsibility from the owners of the system and from the reaction model. That turns out to be very powerful because it has completely separated concerns. As an app developer, all you do is put in a um, start, restart, install, reinstall hook. And the, uh, the reaction system takes care of the rest. So let's actually take a look at the demo. Uh, you should see on the screen my friend uh, Grafana. What Grafana is doing is tracking right now RPMs out of a simulated engine. And the engine, it, we're measuring the RPMs from an application insta uh, that's installed in our floating data center that's pulling, uh, pulling and combining a variety of metrics to provide this. In the world of ships, much like the rest of IoT, there are dozens to hundreds of sensors each of which can and need to be combined into something sensible and meaningful. And our application is doing this. Now, that application has to be completely re reliable, but sometimes just isn't. So the first thing we're going to do is um, actually we're going to shut down the part of the system that generates um, statistics. So if I go back to my Grafana board, um, it'll take, uh, pr I think, about 30 seconds, and then all the uh, cycles will, we'll see, one, the application shut down, which will cause the health check to go down, 
which will then trigger off the reaction cycle. And I think we're uh, 10 seconds to go or so. In a moment, we'll see the health check drop. Now, I'm not going to show the actual trigger because that would be boring to, it's, it is the bane of any demo to all tab your way into, look, take a look at it, tailing this log and this log and this log. Uh, so instead, we'll just depend on the Grafana board. You see my application, the health check has just gone to zero. In the background, uh, this is picked up by tick, which pushes it into influx, which will trigger a uh, capacitor event being pushed to salt, which will trigger a reaction, which will then uh, cause the application to reinstall. And you see the health check coming back to one. So the application, with this cube getting down, uh, being shut down, froze RPMs, but then recovered itself. Now again, that's kind of cool. You built a system that can react to a signal and, um, uh, and heal itself. What becomes a little bit more interesting is if we create a syst is when we cause an event to actually destroy the application. Uh, so the back door I built into it uh, allows me to corrupt the database it's on, which I've just done. So we see this was picked up. Um, the way you can tell it's corrupted is the RPMs have just, have just dropped to negative 500, and that ain't good. A ship should not have RPMs running in the negative. Uh, so obviously something is wrong here. And what the system is going to detect, first it's going to try and reinstall. And we won't see it come back because the application is never healthy in the, I'm sorry, first it tries a restart. And the application is never healthy in the restart. So after trying restart, it'll fall back into reinstall. Uh, and it'll take one more cycle. But in that one more cycle, it'll do a complete reinstall. And we should see two things. We'll see the health check come back to one and we'll see the RPMs come back to a sensible value. And this is the point, point oh, and there go the RPMs. Uh, we, we're caught halfway between measurement. We'll see them go back up to uh, right around uh, 50, which is normal for an engine this size, and we see the health check comes up. So we've gone through um, two cycles on the state machine. We've walked on twice, and we get We'll see this in a sec. And we actually get meaningful values. So again, what we've seen is using the state machine for error conditions and falling back. So we walk down from the monitoring state to application start and sent a signal, received the signal, orchestrated and executed the state. So in the first part of the demo, we went from monitoring to error to application start, uh, which was successful, and the state machine walked back to monitor. In the second part of the demo, we went from monitoring to error, to application start to error again, back to application install. Now again, hard to emphasize enough, what this means to an application developer, they don't care about any of this. Our only requirement on them was ID and potent start and install states so that I could install the same application again and again without problems. That I could start, that I could install the application from a known good state and that I started the application from a known good state. When we put those re easy requirements on, an, on application developers, they fit within our uh, finite state machine framework. It also means that testing of this system is much simpler. The system ends up being having the reliability that we were looking for, which is why we chose the model in the first place. It's not a panacea. Finite state machines are actually very difficult in very complicated environments. We've defined one that we could provide enough simplification and combining of elements that it worked here. But in systems like where there are overlapping states, systems where there are workflows, finite state uh, decomposition doesn't work well at all. But for problems of evolution and healing, they're actually tremendously dynamic. So 
in conclusion, we provided a system that, uh, that was robust under challenges, both um, weather-wise and uh, technology-wise, which allowed the client to produce a system that was much more reliable than they had to the delight of their clients. So successful engagement. And with that, I'm available for any questions. Go ahead. Uh, so the question was, did we ever consider uh, containers? Because obviously a container is something that starts with a, um, in a known state with bundled configuration. One of the things I glossed over here is um, we consider for the application hosting itself using first uh, Kubernetes, but because of bandwidth, I'm sorry, because of resource limitations, installing Kubernetes on this phone became a, uh, a not so good. Uh, we did end up using Docker containers for the applications themselves, which provided the ability to then actually deploy them and all the goodness of deploying Docker and layers, et cetera. So wish you'd been there, but it's what we did too. Cool. Go ahead. So SALT allowed us to orchestrate, uh, let me take, take, back, take a step back. Uh, the question was, given Kubernetes or given um, Docker containers, what, with or salt? Why use salt in that circumstance? Don't you have everything you need? Um, couple things that weren't present with Docker by itself. The first is we needed to orchestrate both uh, the applications we're talking about, the networks themselves, and doing all of the networking, because the networks were external, doing all the networks within a framework, framework like Kubernetes uh, became a non-starter. Uh, we also had reactions of appliances, which became very important to do. And it was, it's hard to conceive of doing that within a, a management framework. And some of the, um, some of the applications were provided by, with vendors who may not have been as enlightened as we hope to think of ourselves, and so containerizing their applications wasn't gonna happen. Other questions? Keep on going. Exactly. We're not self discovering those because those in the parameters. Uh, are intent, usually intensely combined with the application. So some of the orchestration that happens be, behind the scene on application install wasn't just doing things like installing a Docker container. For example, it would also be installing um, uh, hooks in Telegraph and hooks in Capacitor. The hook in Telegraph would be, what do you want us to measure? Like, where's the output? The hook in uh, Capacitor would be, what are my limits to trigger something? No, they're, very, they're defined hooks. And what, what an application install is adding to that hook. So in other words, every application has um, three defined hooks. Uh, install it, uh, configure it, and run it. And each of those would get a monitoring hook, and each of those would get a reaction hook. They provide parameters to define that, yeah, for sure. Yeah, there's, I, we couldn't figure a way around that um, negative 500 may be very, very meaningful for many things. For an engine, it's not. Well, uh, the, the question was, did we end up building our own DSL for that? No, uh, because the orchestration around, um, especially in this case, capacitor, is pretty well defined. 
I mean, you can create a, um, uh, a defined template that then imports other templates, and what we're doing is dropping other templates into those hooks. Sure. Hassan, other question? Go ahead. So the question is, once a failure occurred, did we capture that? Uh, and some of the things we might have captured is any reaction that took place, the states that were fired, uh, the telemetry, et cetera. Yeah, that all went back over the wire. So the most important thing to our client was that their system was bulletproof. And any, pl any place and any time the system wasn't bulletproof, they were highly interested in knowing. Um, I mentioned that uh, the bandwidth was, was bad. A better way of putting it was that the bandwidth was incredibly, incredibly expensive. If anyone's ever made a phone call on a cruise ship, I haven't, but I've been told that it's ridiculous. Like uh, um, uh, cents per second, uh, dollars, tens of dollars per minutes. And so these guys did not want us sending a lot of stuff over the wire because it wasn't that traffic wasn't revenue bearing. But in the case of failure, that was all off the table. Like, they wanted to know why things were failing. So we would tend to um, over-instrument and over-send at that point. There was also a, a constant telemetry fee, some of which they paid for, some of which uh, their vendors would pay for. Like GE would pay for the bandwidth to get the signals off the engine because they really wanted to know the performance of the engine. How did we cover? that would trigger a, a second order failure, which would go down two states. Like one of the things I mentioned, and in passing, but the, the question is, what do you do when you got into a, a, a loop, like a restart loop? Uh, I'd mentioned in passing the importance of path on the state machine. You need to know if this is the first pass through a state or a set, through an air state or second. And on the second pass, you'd walk further down the state diagram. And because you're always starting from a completely known good state, you can't go all the way down. You eventually find a place where um, uh, the system starts up healthy. It may then start layering stuff on top. Like you may have a bad application, at which point, um, at some point, one of two things happen. Where, where we didn't get was that application is never installed again. We were still at the point of that telemetry goes back to um, central location, which removes that state from, uh, from the host. The application's bad. Take out the application. And that, that became a manual in, in intervention, um, but that's a bad thing. So the um, the goal was to make that completely automated as well. I saw a question over here. Sure. So what your event, so the question was, uh, if I could explain a little bit more about the update process and the patching process. Um, what you're patching uh, when you send up, first uh, I'll talk about the um, actual update mechanism itself because it's kind of cool. Uh, because ships are, uh, we had two completely unusual difficult constraints. One was, one was a magnification of the, the common data center problem. What happens if the machine isn't up there uh, when it's patched? And so we had the same sort of issue of uh, having uh, the end system phone home for any updates on a regular basis. The second um, problem was how do we get patches out to this fleet? And we had to uh, play games with, uh, with both Delta RPMs and anything we could do Delta, like we would never push a full Docker container. We'd only push a Delta Docker, Docker so that uh, we would limit bandwidth use. The more interesting question though is once all the packages that we used got onto the, the distant system, how did we actually um, manage that system? And the result there was to patch a state, not pass patch an application. 
like you would install, um, for example, if you're patching, uh, I don't know, let's say we're patching Telegraph. That's pretty far down the state machine. And so we roll the system back to that state, patch it, and see if we can roll forward or not. Now we're very confident we can roll forward because we've, we've tested the states with these new patches, but uh, we don't patch at a high state, we patch at a low state. And so always build up from um, known good up through patched state. And the one thing we couldn't do in this system um, was patch the base OS because we had no control over the base, base OS. So when those patches needed to happen, they, need, uh, they happened in port or when the, um, uh, when the tech guy got out to the mine site or the tech guy was out on the platform or whatever. But, and so we would patch a state and then build, this, build past that state. Um, so, all else being equal, we could have managed the um, base OS, of course. The reason we couldn't in this use case is we didn't own it. So, the machine that we're, we're we look to the owner of the machine, which is typically the um, management of the ship, which is different from the ownership, which is different from the, uh, the crew or the people who are contacting us. Um, we look like an application to them. So they, they go in and they install our product, use the product, and then we manage all the internals of the product, which provide networking. And they own the base OS, so they own the patching. And to them, we look like a black box. Go ahead. Um, one, of, one of the coolest things about working for the company that contracted us was they would do beta testing on cruise ships. And so they would have to send their engineer to um, the Bahamas or uh, the Southeast Asia, or if it was during the summer, they might do the, uh, um, the Baltic or something. And they'd spend a week. And the crews would love these guys because it was communications. So they'd say, everybody gets free Wi-Fi this week. And these are guys who are typically like uh, $10 for a five minute call. If you say you can call any, anyone you want, um, they love you. So that was an uncommon occurrence, and for us it only happened at the beginning of the project. There weren't cases where we had to uh, send somebody in, um, into one of the distant locations, and I wasn't one of the guys who got to go to the cruise ship. Any other questions? Go ahead. Um, so the data on the on the edge side was heavily cached. Uh, from a uh, monitoring metric standpoint, everything went into influx. There was also uh, logs that were shipped and heavily, heavily uh, redacted and those would go uh, across the wire if and when. Uh, the client had some proprietary software for bandwidth limitations that did all sorts of tricks to try and maximize uh, their throughput. But if a ship was offline, it would typically cache for a period of time, um, and then you'd start to lose data, and it would be in a round robin fashion, and you'd lose the oldest stuff. It was unfortunate, but what else could you do? I think we're there. Everyone, thank you so much for your attention.